missions, informing them about the dress code during the summer. And the dress code uh, during the summer is short sleeves, no ties, no jackets. So now it feels uh, like Israel's so, okay. so you are most welcome to follow our dress code. Okay. <laughs> this is my sacrifice to Israel in the yeah, okay. <laughs> I'm not here today to talk about uh, what Lithuania can learn from Israel. I don't think that I know uh, enough about Lithuania to advise Lithuanians what you can learn from Israel. But I'm here to talk about the Israeli experience and to share with you uh, at least my perspective about uh, Israel, about my country, the country where I was born. And I think that uh, uh, there is one thing that uh, I was thinking about when I was preparing myself for this uh, meeting is uh, that right from day number one, from May 14, 1948, the day that uh, the State of Israel was established, the day that uh, the first uh, Prime Minister, Mr. Ben Gurion, uh, declared the independency, we were basically pushed to the corner. We were pushed and left without not too many options. And when one is pushed to the corner, there are, in principle, three basic options. One to say, sorry, I can't handle it. It's too big for me, too difficult. The enemies are huge and we are down number. We will not be able to win this war. The second option is to bypass the problem, the challenge. I don't like to use the words problems, the challenges. And that's easy, but when you are bypassing the challenge, you're not really responding to the challenge. And the third, and that's what I believe in, 
is to try and overcome the challenge. And that's, in short, the story of the state of Israel. From day number one, we were forced to defend ourselves. Our neighbors were not very friendly, and I'm using a diplomatic <laughs> word. From day number one, seven Arab armies invaded the state of Israel in an effort to eliminate this you know, newly born country, the babies in, in town. And somehow we won this war. And whenever I'm talking about the Israeli experience, there is another thing that I emphasize, that I mention, that it's not about what you have, it's what you do with what you have. Again, it's not about what you have, it's not about the number of tanks, the number of uh, artillery or airplanes. Because if it would be only for the numbers, I would be standing here as the ambassador of the Church of Israel. It's about the spirit. It's about the will. And that's how we won the War of Independence. But, you know, we also need to understand that when it comes to the state of Israel, it's not just about security and defense. It's not just about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. It's also about agriculture. And when we establish our country, we somehow ended in a place that was very poor when it comes to natural resources. You know, wherever you go in the Middle East, you do like this, oil comes out. It's like Lithuania, wherever you go, you do like this, water comes out. So, we neither have oil nor water. And I'm usually, you know, using this uh, kind of joke when I talk about Lithuania, so I said, wow, you have thousands of lakes. Do you know how many lakes we have in Israel? So usually people are saying, one. The other one is saying two. And I look at them and say, you know what? You are both right. <laughs> so people ask me, how come? How can both people be right? I said, yes, we have two, but one of them is dead. <laughs> <laughs> so what we did was really something that, uh, once again, we were pushed to the corner and we were thinking, how can we provide our people with water? So, first and foremost, we develop a system to take the water from the northern Sea of Galilee to the southern part of Israel, in terms of water management. We build the infrastructure. So, when you open the tub in Beersheba, the capital of the south, the, the waters that are running in the pipes are from the Sea of Galilee. Doesn't mean that you have to wait for half an hour or this. <laughs> but that's just to give you an idea. And then we also develop the desalination. We take water from the Mediterranean, very salty water, and we turn them into drinking water. We take sewage. Yeah, sewage water. We purify them and we water our in the past, we watered the uh, orange groves and other crops. And this is just an example. Once again, a problem, a challenge, and we found a solution. Let's stick to the agriculture. Milk. Milking production. Can you guess what is the uh, average milking production per cow in Israel? It's one of the highest in the world. It's about 11,000 liters per cow. And it's not... Huh? In a year. In a year. Yeah. In a year. It's not enough. 11,000. And you know, and it's not uh, in any way a form of criticism, here in Lithuania, it's about 6,000. Now, it's not because we are doing something better. We may be using different methods. The system here is different. You still have these private farms. 
farmers that own two or three cows, milking them every day, and the truck from the original dairy farm is collecting the buckets, literally. And these farmers are getting about 0 0.3 cent uh, uh, euro per liter. You also have uh, modern uh, farms in uh, many other places, but it's not enough. That's why the uh, uh, average uh, milking production is about the 6,000. And you'll be surprised to find out that your local companies, the, uh, the very good ones, our neighbors, uh, Janos Vlijdeis and uh, uh, Vilkischkiu, they're importing milk from the surrounding countries. This is just an example. And people were talking about the military service. Yeah, you are a military country. And uh, I was interviewed quite a lot when uh, it was decided by uh, Lithuania by the, the previous government in May uh, 2015 to reintroduce conscription. And I was asked about the military service. And my response was, military service is not just, or compulsory service, it's not just about defense and security. It's about so many other things. It's about discipline, maturity, responsibility, improvisation. And I'm talking a little bit about it because later when we we'll talk about the uh, uh, story of success of Israel when it comes to startups, the number of startups that uh, uh, every year are popping here and there. So there is, there are, there is a relationship, a linkage between the uh, success of the Israeli startups and the military service. Because in the military, our soldiers, officers are faced with challenges, not problems. And they need to find solutions. Not to bypass, not to surrender, but to overcome, to improvise. Sometimes under pressure. And that's what makes the whole difference. And military service is not just about what uh, the country can do for me, but also, as Jeff K said, what I can give back to the country. And that's, I believe, uh, part of the reason why Israel is so successful. So Israel is not just about agriculture, not just about milking uh, production and uh, desanilation. We also develop, uh, you know, when you don't have the luxury to uh, use uh, uh, low-pressure water systems, you need to use high-pressure water system. You need to use drippings. So we developed, invented the drippings. Very simple system. It's a pipe with holes. And each hole is uh, facing uh, a pad. And the plant gets the exact amount of water that it's needed. You don't need to waste water. And today you can find dripping systems all over the world. There are factories in Australia, in Asia, it's everywhere. And uh, I can go on and on and talk about the uh, Israeli success in uh, uh, medical machinery. We have here uh, uh, a well-known uh, Israeli uh, uh, pharmaceutical company, Teva, and Teva is uh, a world giant when it comes to pharmaceutical uh, um, uh, products. And uh, of course, we also have a very strong uh, military and defense industry, uh, which is uh, cooperating with uh, Lithuania since 2015. Three major Israeli companies are helping the Lithuanian armed forces to build its uh, capabilities following the decision in May 2015 to increase the defense budget. So one company is providing uh, terrors and anti-tanks uh, guided missiles to the uh, ITV boxer, the uh, infantry fighting vehicle. Other company is upgrading the uh, motors which are on the uh, old uh, American platform M113. Third company just recently won another current tender, and uh, they're going to provide uh, the Lithuanian armed forces with some radar systems. And I can go uh, on and on. But I think that at the end of the day, uh, there is one thing that for me is very important uh, to emphasize it's the love of our people to our country, it's the pride in our country. And yes, it's not always very easy. It's uh, usually very hot, and uh, some of you may say, yeah, we like it, this is a wonderful weather, 
So I didn't bring my uh, laptop, but I could show you uh, a clip which I showed this morning to a number of journalists who are heading to Israel. And it's about uh, interviews with uh, Lithuanian basketball fans who uh, uh, stayed in Israel during the uh, Euro, Euro Cup last September. And uh, they were interviewed. And they were saying, oh, how fun it is in Israel. It's so great, but it's so cold. Everyone of the people that were interviewed were complaining about the weather in Israel. And when I came here, people were complaining to me about the weather here. Oh, it's so cold, it's so dark, neira, saule, etc., etc. But when you take them to, you know, a little bit warmer uh, uh, place, so they're once again complaining about the weather. So no matter what, yes, it may be humid during the summer, it may be dry during the uh, winter, and yes, we don't have too many lakes. But this is my country, my homeland, which I'm very proud of. And I think that this is something that helps a lot for a nation, especially for a young nation, the pride but to be part of this uh, uh, country. Some to be proud that, uh, you know, whenever I talk to Lithuanians, and once again, it's not that I'm trying to imply something, but you also have a beautiful country. And you have well, thousands of lakes. Some of them are located in, uh, in paradises. I wish we had some of them in Israel. And the blossom of all these flowers, you know, now when you are traveling all over the country, you see the blossom of the luminous. And I was told, I was told by uh, my dear friend, uh, the Minister of the Environment, that uh, in Lithuania there are considerations to eliminate some of the areas uh, of the luminous, because uh, the luminous are very uh, evasive, and they are uh, uh, harming the agriculture. In Israel, they are protected flowers, because we don't have too many of them. <laughs> Really, there are only two, three places where you can enjoy the blossom of the luminous, and they're not as tall and high as they are here, but Majuka. <laughs> and uh, when in February and uh, mid-February, beginning of March, when the, they are blossoming, hundreds of Israelis are traveling just to enjoy these, you know, two, three days of uh, blossom. And it's just one example, because here in Lithuania, wherever you go, you see this, uh, wow, from the Djibouti to the PNS to the Yelva, <laughs> it's uh, Kachuka, it's <laughs> really, no, it, and, and also, it's not just about the flowers, it's also about the people, because in the end of the day we can talk about uh, places, we can talk about churches, uh, architecture, really, art, but for me, it's uh, in the end of the day all about people. People are the one to make the difference. And I think that this is what I was trying in my short uh, introduction, I hope that it was not too long, to convey to you that it's, in the end of the day, all about the people. The people are the ones to make the change. Actually, ah, and I promise that, yeah, this is how the, we, uh, this year we're celebrating 100 years of uh, Lithuania and 70 years of Israel. And, uh, Last year we uh, uh, came out with uh, this pin, but it's not just about the pin. It's uh, a logo which uh, accompany our activities uh, last year, all year long. And this logo was uh, uh, designed to mark the 25th anniversary of the uh, establishment of diplomatic relationship between Israel and Lithuania. And it's in, very, in many ways reflect how I see cooperation. It's very easy to ask a professional to come up with ideas. That's not what we did. We asked students from the Vilnius Art Academy to come up with ideas. 56 works uh, were presented, out, uh, from which we selected one. The one of uh, Katrina, a student from the faculty in uh, Kaunas. And then we brought the postal authority to the picture, so they decided to print about 200,000 Stamps, you still can find them in the uh, ashtas, in the postal uh, offices. And the amount is 97 cents. You know why 97 cents? Because that's the amount of money that is needed in order to send a letter from Lithuania to Israel. 
And yes, people still send letters. And then we came up with the idea to have a pin. And this year we mark 70 years and Lithuania mark 100 years. So we once again asked the students to come up with ideas and they ended with this logo, 100 years and 70 years to Israel. So it's a great honor to present you with <coughs> this one. Oh, thanks. <clears throat> Shall we respond with our other speakers or start with uh, questions? Uh, it's improvised. We do. Of course, I want to hear. <laughs> you want to hear. And then, <laughs> then we come with questions, right? Okay, so then. <clears throat> there is. <laughs> oh, uh, Ambassador. The... After such an inspiring speech, it's very difficult to open your mouth, actually. But I think we heard the essence about Israel. We didn't hear too many facts, dates, names, but we heard the essence of of what it takes to create a country. And Lithuania, though even we historically count 800 years, and you said. Uh, the history of Jews in Lithuania counts already 700 years. But we are historically a young nation as well. And when you think about the darkness of 19th century, Lithuania was a very improbable project. There were some people dreaming about the recreation of the state or creation of the independent state of Lithuania. But in the, as I said again, in the darkness and all, all the bunch of challenges in Tsarist Russia, I think it was it was only dreamers that that fancied to dream about this period. I think it took exactly the same spirit as you said, Mr. Ambassador, not what you have, but you, what you do with that. And they had very little, and they did a lot. They created a literary language. They created cities. You, you mentioned art academy, and you mentioned commerce. Uh, I'm very thankful for that because. Art Academy is my alma mater and Kolnitz is my hometown. So I spoke, I, I had a privilege to speak about Kolnitz architecture uh, just a couple of weeks ago in this very place. And this is one of the success stories on how Jewish population, Jewish citizens could make their own creativity to flourish in Lithuania. And it is absolutely unique. Because when you hear about Chagall, you hear about uh, ben Shan, you hear about Lebanon, about other Litvak heroes, they made their careers somewhere else. Paris, New York. But there, there were Kolnas intellectuals, Kolnas architects, who really flourished and they were creatively very active and very impressive in those two decades before the war. So I think I would very much connect to what you said because we don't have resources, even though we have water, we don't have oil, we don't have a huge population as big European nations. We are a geopolitically very vulnerable nation. We have a big neighbor, which is still not very democratic neighbor, not very peaceful neighbor. We are fortunately part of the European family, which is meeting with very ch many challenges today. But uh, if we lose the spirit that we want to create our country, that we want, that we lose the faith in our country, I think this is this is over. This is over. The growing GDP doesn't count. All the memberships and all the powerful world organizations do not count. I think that this is the spirit inside. This is the, the faith you have. This is the solidarity you have. This is all. And it is very inspiring to have such an ally and such a friend as Israel. It's, it's not because lots of Litvaks lived in Israel or South Africa, but not just that. I think it is, it is a democratic, it is a cradle of democracy surrounded by countries that are coping with their political systems. Uh, Lebanon, Lebanese people are wonderful, but, but the state is very complicated. I'm not talking about Syria, I'm not talking about uh, other Middle Eastern or 
or, or other countries of the region, it is really, really a challenge. So geopolitically, it is a little bit parallel, it's a little bit similar, because nothing is, is given to you for granted. If you lose, uh, if you are careless and you pay no attention, you can lose your country once again. And Lithuania was occupied six times in the last 200 years. So this is really a lesson to learn, and, and some lessons have to be learned for sure and forever. Because if you, if you don't pay attention to certain very important things, uh, I think no country can, can count on, on her future. Uh, President Brazauskas, who is very famous in Israeli-Lithuanian relationship because he hugged and kissed uh, Holocaust survivor in '94 during his state uh, uh, visit, used to say that Lithuania is going to be like Sweden very soon. But now I have read the book that Lots of young people, they sort of stop believing that it is possible to create Sweden here. It is I'm easier. Sorry, they don't want Sweden anymore. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, you name it, Sweden, Norway, Ireland, United States, Germany. It is easier to travel to those countries because Germany or UK or Norway is already created for granted. And it takes a lot to create a welfare state in a post-communist society. So I think the challenges are still there, and the climate is among the smallest challenges, if you name them all. I think uh, keeping the faith, keeping the spirit of solidarity, <coughs> believing in solidarity, believing in your own capacity to, to construct society, th this is what we need, and uh, Israel comes as a really inspiring example. We are surrounded by, by books, by drawings, by, by sources, witnessing the, the, the long and winding road that, that Israeli society took uh, until it reached this, this present state of a really uh, a rich, inspiring, culturally flourishing country. And I'm proud to have visited Israel in 2011. Uh, I was looking through the history of Lithuanian relationship and was sort of happy and proud to see my name. We visited Yad Vashem, we visited Ben Hatzot, we visited many other institutions. We, we saw wonderful Israeli contemporary dance in the white city, in this city of creative industries. So uh, it's lots of things that we could operate on. Uh, but I think we, we have to particularly bear in mind two things. Uh, never forget the past, however painful it is. And I'm very happy that it is much easier to talk about the past in Lithuania than it was, for example, 10 years ago, not to speak 20 years ago. But it was almost impossible to, to face Holocaust, to face collaboration. People didn't want to listen at all. Now, I think the new generation is much more flexible, much more open-minded, much more <coughs> liberal, democratically orientated, and uh, I think it is improving. And uh, number two is the present and the future. This is why I'm so proud to take part in the commemoration and uh, memorialization of the Grand Synagogue of Vilna. Because it is something that really inspires you, it is something that, uh, that gives body and content to, to the present day cooperation. Because uh, only to remember the past and only to, to be concentrated on history, it is not enough. It has to be some exciting today's and, and tomorrow's prospects. And I, and I think we have a lot. I will not quote our President Vygotsky, but after she opened this economy forum in, in Tel Aviv a couple of years ago, if I'm not mistaken. 2015, so it coincided with your appointment as an ambassador. No, it was already part of my job here. It was already a part of your job. <laughs> um, she visited in uh, October 2015 and the embassy was open in January. Okay, so just in 10 months, the relationship started booming. So uh, probably you will agree with her, Mr. Ambassador, that we are witnessing the 
state of relationship between the two countries that has never been seen before. And I really hope that it will stay this way, that we will bear on positive prospects and uh, optimistic, energetic people with vision and somehow overcome the challenges that are still there. Of course, there are quite many of them. But uh, I'm a believer in the Israeli-Lithuanian relationship. And uh, I was happy to contribute wherever I could. But when I had possibility, and it's a pleasure to be here together with you, Professor Beisaita, my dear friend Chilvenas, those wonderful people who didn't go to swim in the lake, even though it's 21 degrees, <laughs> and it's already very warm. But I will thus for this discussion. And uh, my, my school teacher said, don't give uh, Galunas to eat, but give, give him to speak. So uh, uh, I'm sorry if I'm talking too long. There's plenty of things to cover, there's plenty of things to mention. But uh, we are here to, to celebrate the great uh, dates for our countries. And I think our countries have future for cooperation. And I can see very positive signs that it is going right well. I'm sure Aruma Sajnaya is not the only one believer in good uh, relations between Israel and Lithuania. There are plenty of ship of those who share this belief. And we are happy to that this day is actually we. I, I wanted if we can uh, be uh, celebrating our states, but we can be celebrating Garena all this year long because she has got her anniversary. <laughs> You see, I have a problem because my English is not so good. I am from a different generation. My parents didn't speak English. They spoke a lot of European languages, but not English. And my English is still very weak. So if I am short for words, you will help me. But I must say that to this day today, is somehow a realization of my dream I had my whole life. I always wanted, I belong to two nations. I am Jewish and I'm Lithuanian. And these are my two, uh, two cultures. And I want them to, co uh, to cooperate, to be together, to, to respect each other. And uh, when I met you, Your Excellency, and of course, uh, Arubas and many other people here is my, I can be proud of my former student, now I am his student, Toledis, who is really a big friend of Israel and brings together people from both sides. Uh, I am very happy that it happens and I really believe that uh, our friendship will last. We have really a lot in common. I remember when President of uh, Israel, Paris, was really a very respectful person. Uh, um, uh, he was here as a guest of Lithuania, and I was also invited to the uh, dinner in the presidential office. Uh, and uh, he told, uh, I remember it always, he said, we have a lot in common, Israel and Lithuania. He said, we have, we are both very little countries, very little countries, and we have, we had a very hard fight for our independence. Uh, uh, and the second he said, that uh, uh, we also have, we are very little, but we have very big neighbors, like elephants, who are a big danger to us. So I think that this is really what we have in common. And still, uh, your speech really is, is inspiring because it gives you uh, the, the essence, that is really the most important thing is the spirit. And we had such spirit, as you mentioned, is in Israel, uh, when our style is there. And it was really something. Every day we saw clever men. 
uh, very, uh, very, precious, very, right. yeah, courage, courageous. Right. Uh, yeah, uh, we were so proud. We were so united. We were, uh, we did not uh, divide ourselves in in, in different you know, groups. Everybody start, uh, tried to understand each other. And then suddenly after three years, I don't know how, it somehow uh, was, didn't last for long, this unity. And this is a very big, uh, big danger for our country. And I hope we will overcome it. Uh, because otherwise, as you said, we will not, we will not survive. We have to overcome, and uh, overcome our, our, you know, hatred, our intolerance, uh, our nationalism, which also exists, uh, which is, is, which is not clever. Uh, it is, it is destroying Ukraine, not bringing together different, uh, uh, different. Power different, uh, but but dividing it. So I hope that we will overcome it and and we will be strong. And I think that our cooperation with Israel will make us stronger and will help us because we really have a lot to learn. Our big difference with Israel. It maybe not. Maybe I'm not right. But you will tell me. We have a very, very difficult past. A very difficult past. We really had a big uh, touch of big touch of Lithuania. We were very proud of this time. And then we were united with Poland, which was not so bad, but we it was I think in many ways mistreated this period, but this the story is still better. And uh, and uh, then we were, as you said, how many times occupied? Six times. And one occupation was worse than the other. Mm -hmm. When the Russian Tsar occupied us, we, our language was forbidden. We couldn't speak Lithuanian. We couldn't write Latin letters. We couldn't print our books. And uh, we, Lithuania, showed a big resistance. We had the Knigneshe. Actually, oh, many Jews were also Knigneshev. They were bringing from Russia the books which were printed in uh, Latin letters. Um, then we had um, a, a very short time of uh, freedom, of independence in 1918. But uh, I would say that uh, that uh, Kaiser, the, Germany. Huh? Kaiser's Germany. Kaiser Germany was yet yeah, during the First World War. It was also very bad. And then, but not as bad as the Second Occupation. <laughs> yeah. That's for sure. Yeah, that, that's for sure. And uh, then we, uh, we, we, we lost Vilnius, which was really our capital, and we were very much connected. You know, very much like this. Uh, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. parallel between Vilnius and Jerusalem. Uh, you probably all know that uh, Vilnius was the, was the capital that Vilnius founded in, uh, in, in the 13th or 14th century. And, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and then we, uh, Vilnius was uh, inhabited by Poles, by Jews, you know that during the First World War in Vilnius there were only about 2% of Lithuanian speaking people. So it was not a Lithuanian city, but historically it was a Lithuanian city, it was the capital of Lithuania. And when Oskar Milos defended our case in Europe, he said that if you uh, try to um, solve the problem in a realistic such way, then, of course, uh, if you make a referendum, but the Sotsky made, uh, the Poles won because they were the majority and the Jewish population was also quite colonized. Uh, 
but if you take it in a sense, in a spiritual, spiritual yeah, uh, then uh, you know that it has to be the, the capital of Lithuania because this is the symbol of Lithuania, of the creation of our, of our country and so on. Jerusalem is also the same. Many years in Spain and Jerusalem. And uh, Palestinians live there, and there were no Arabs and so on. But then, still, Jerusalem must belong to the, to, to, uh, to the Jewish uh, state because Jews were for, for centuries and centuries staying every day next here in Jerusalem. Jerusalem is a saint city. I don't know if you understand my English. I am very sorry. Uh, uh, but uh, I think you, you understand. So uh, it has to belong to Israel. But people are pragmatic and don't want to uh, very often to, to see the spiritual side of the problem. And, and really, when you, we think that Arabs have so much, uh, so much uh, territory, and Israel is so small. And I think it could be this good will save very, very, uh, solved very, very soon fast. But this good will is not there. People are educated in hatred. And uh, I don't know, uh, I don't want to, uh, to <laughs> speak about that because I can't say. It's a very, very, you know, like. All the mayor, I will, I will finish with her words. All the mayor said, I always remember her words. She said, We can forgive the Arabs that they killed our children, but we can't forgive the Arabs that they forced us to vote. I just want to clarify two things, and I completely agree with the uh, uh, member of parliament, uh, Ilunas, that the relationship... Ilunas, Ilunas. <laughs> yeah, no difference, but please don't <laughs> <don't know>. <laughs> are getting better and better, and uh, it has nothing to do with uh, the uh, opening of the embassy. It's something that started years before, with... Uh, uh, the uh, very good uh, visit of uh, President, uh, the late President Perez in 2013, the former Israeli ambassadors that covered uh, Lithuania from uh, Riga, and I think that once again it was also the people who to really get together. The second point that I would like to uh, emphasize that uh, yes, the past is important. But as you mentioned, it's also about the present and the future. And for me, the present and the future are completely disconnected from the past. Uh, we, uh, uh, at least in my, uh, in my term as an ambassador, we see our mission as, built, as based on two pillars. One of them is the past, and we are doing our utmost in order to bring Lithuania and better understand uh, what, they are, what they lost. And uh, in that uh, respect, just next week, not next week, I'm sorry, day after tomorrow, a very important ceremony is going to be held in Kaunas. The commander of the army, General Zhukas, is going to hold the ceremony in honor of the uh, Jewish soldiers that hold shoulder to shoulder with their brothers, the Lithuanian soldiers, during the War of Independence, Lithuanian War of Independence. And this is also true about uh, economy. Many factories were founded and established by Jewish people. And when you go around today in the country, you don't find traces to the uh, founders of these uh, factories. Cucumber factory in, uh, in uh, Kedaine, Ethno factory, herbal teas in Svinchonis, and I can go on and on. And I think that it's very important to do more in order for Lithuanians to better understand the scope of the Jewish contribution to the building of Lithuania as a nation. 
And once people understand it, they may also realize that when we're talking about the Jewish people, we're not basically talking about my heritage, but about your heritage. So we are doing our utmost to bring people to better understand, and today it's easier. I don't uh, have the tools to compare uh, how was it 10 years ago, but I find it uh, very easy to talk to people about it. Uh, I'm traveling a lot, and uh, I uh, find people very attentive and very uh, respectful. The progress is a very slow progress, but I'm not in a hurry. I believe that uh, people should take the time that uh, they need in order to move uh, forward. And we are investing a lot uh, uh, in the young generation. We just took uh, high school children to Israel. Uh, tomorrow we will have here uh, high school children from Israel here from Elad. And in October we'll have more. In February we'll have more. We're trying to do uh, as much as we can. The other pillar is the present and the future. And I didn't want to bore you with detail, but there is, I believe, no field that we are not uh, already cooperating. Education, and it's not just ordinary education. The Israeli methods of uh, educating children with learning disabilities is already implemented here in Lithuania. And this is something that we started uh, two and a half years ago. And we completed the training and now Lithuanian teachers and professionals are going to train others on this very important issue. And the method is coach your child for success. The role of the parent in bringing your ch child to succeed, to succeed. And you know how you measure success of cooperation? When the government, the local government, or the recipient side, decides that from now on they are going to cover all expenses. <laughs> <laughs> and that's really, that's how we measure it. And on autism, we already had three, four rounds of uh, workshops, seminars, during which we shared our experiences. And yes, I know that uh, there, are still, there are still some differences between the old guards who believe in the uh, uh, traditional treatment to the new, to do the new doctors uh, led by Professor Daniel Spura who believe in uh, uh, alternative uh, medicine and we are cooperating with them and I can go on and on. We are also doing a lot with children because this is part of our values and it's about giving. You know, all the time when we are celebrating birthdays we think about ah, what I'm going to get uh, for my birthday. People are preparing wishful uh, list. And we decided after the uh, first uh, uh, reception that we held in 2015 that we are not going to have this uh, fancy reception during which you serve people with food and drinks. Let's face it, maybe very uh, uh, short uh, musical performance. So we are using the money to help others. Because we believe in giving, and sometimes it's a better feeling to give than to receive. And the point that I would like to emphasize is that there is no linkage between these two pillars. We are really uh, trying to promote relation in the present and the future like there was no past. And we are doing our utmost to bring the Lithuanians to better understand what happened in the past like there is no present and future. Last but not least, then you mentioned about the hard history. We also have the very hard history, which lasted not several hundreds of years, but thousands of years. In April, uh, on April uh, the 12th, we marked in Israel the uh, uh, Holocaust uh, Martyrs and Heroes Memorial Day. And uh, we commemorate the memory of the six million Jews that were murdered during the Second World War. That was the price that we paid for not having a state. And a week afterwards, it was our memorial. And the uh, day before the uh, Day of Independence, uh, the entire nation was mourning, visiting cemeteries, visiting the 23,658 soldiers, officers, men, women, fathers, mothers that sacrifice their life defending the country. 
that's the price that we paid for having a company, for keeping our company. And this is, in the end of the day, what uh, Israel stands for. And it goes back to the, uh, the people, the spirit, and also from time to time to the sacrifice. Last but not least, and that's the last remark, uh, sometimes I feel that Lithuanians are in a hurry. And uh, you are absolutely right, you are only 28 years old. I don't know where Israel was only after 28 years. Now we are 70 years old, so uh, yes, we can show off uh, some of our successes. But I still think that uh, uh, Lithuania is indeed a very young country with a bright uh, future and uh, I have uh, no doubts that uh, relation between Israel and Lithuania will um, prosper and will develop and uh, it will be just good. So, that's what I was about to ask. Would you accept some questions from the audience? So, but... Well, we do not have any questions, so statements. So, okay, we first time. Yes, uh, thank you so much for your speeches. Um, so I've been to Israel a couple of times, and um, it's very interesting for me because I really like Israel and I have many friends, but it's very interesting because every time I come back to Europe, I feel like this beauty and this kind of harmony I feel in Israel is kind of not reflected in the way people see it abroad, outside of Israel. So, and now we also see a rise of antisemitism in Europe and nationalism and so on. So how can we actually change the view of Israel outside of Israel as well? Well, I think that uh, this is, uh, for me, uh, it's a very good question, and also a very hard question to, uh, to answer from an official representative. <laughs> um, we live in a world where there are perceptions and myths. And uh, when I started my position here, and it's not my first uh, diplomatic post, I was, was also uh, I, I, I also faced uh, with some remarks about the, uh, the Jewish bargain, the uh, very wealthy Jewish people. The, uh, uh, I was once even invited uh, to an interview, and here in Lithuania, the uh, journalists, yes, are very polite. They sent me, they sent me the uh, questions in advance. And one of the questions was, what there is in the Jewish gene that makes them so successful in business? And uh, two years ago, and I want to use an example, not two years, yeah, not two years ago, um, in 2017, for the first time, I decided to do something about the way that Lithuanians celebrate Ushgaviness. A wonderful festival, really. You know, a pagan tradition to get rid of this cold uh, winter and to scare the winter. And how do you scare them? They went there by making ugly masks of Jewish people, gypsies and others. That's how you scare them. Now, when I started to talk about it, and I only posted something, it led to a major public discussion. Now, people were not really aware that by doing it, they are hurting, harming others' people's feelings. Now, I didn't ask to abolish this festival. I only asked, let's do it, let's celebrate it in a way and manner that everybody will make everyone happy. And the most important thing, that it will really scare the winter. <laughs> we can use so many other means to do it. So sometimes it's simply ignorance. And when I'm, when, People are talking about anti-Semitism, so I think that you should make the distinction between the modern anti-Semitism to the, uh, the very primitive one. The very primitive uh, one is the one that I'm talking about, about the perceptions. 
Jewish people are rich. Jewish people are not rich. Jewish people are as rich as non-Jewish people are. But we take care of, it, of uh, our people as a community. The community is always organized. There are community institutions. Yes, sometimes they are fighting with each other. But if you check the history, you see that in every town and city in Lithuania, there were Jewish institutions, Jewish schools, Jewish synagogues, welfare system that help each other. We didn't let the ones that are behind to stay behind. And that was what the community did. About the modern anti-Semitism, we sometimes, the Israelis, fail to make the distinction between a legitimate criticism to anti-Semitism. And some Israelis, whenever Israel is criticized for our policies here and there, are using the uh, term, oh, don't listen to them, they are anti-Semitic. I disagree with them. Israel should be, uh, you know, as a, demo as a democratic country, we should uh, accept a legitimate criticism. And uh, the reality today that, uh, you know, the uh, majority of the democratic countries, the so-called Western world, uh, does not approve some of our policies. But they does not approve only the policies that are related to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And our problem is that for many countries, there is only one issue when it comes to Israel, and it's the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Countries are making uh, some uh, unnecessary uh, conditions to the progress in the bilateral relationship, to the progress in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And this is something, something that for us is difficult to accept. Take the European Union as an example. So as an organization, the only country in our region that the European Union did not conclude the association agreement is the State of Israel. But they did, con they did conclude the association agreement negotiation <coughs> with Lebanon, with Syria, others and others. Take the Human Rights uh, Commission in Geneva. If you check the number of resolutions that were adopted against the State of Israel, you may think that Israel is the only country in the world that violates human rights. Now, I'm not using it as an excuse. I think that we should be always uh, a country that uh, respect international law, follow uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, international code when it comes to human rights and any other uh, an issue. But uh, there are many reasons why Israel is uh, under the uh, continuous scrutiny of uh, the international community. And if you really want to uh, get into it, uh, my recommendation to you is to take uh, Thomas Friedman, a well-known uh, publicist, uh, American publicist, writing for the New York Times, to take his book From Beirut to Jerusalem, which he wrote uh, after the uh, 1982 war uh, in Lebanon. And uh, he dedicated a chapter, a whole chapter in his book, and it was not a very sympathetic book to uh, my country, in which he's trying to explain why the international media is so much interested in uh, what is going on in Israel. Now I can give you an academic uh, also uh, explanation. Let's not forget that when it comes to the, to, to the uh, uh, Western world, we're talking about uh, Christian world, and uh, it goes back to the uh, Old Testament versus the New Testament, the uh, chosen people versus the new chosen people. And uh, it's always very curious for the newly chosen people to find out what the, the ones that were chosen but are abandoned are doing. And I can uh, continue, and when we're talking about uh, why should you at all follow events that are taking place in uh, Arabe. Do you know where is Arabe? No. It's easier to follow events that are taking place in Jerusalem, in Nazareth, in Bethlehem. And I can, that's what Tom Friedman is uh, writing about. Uh, 
And this is uh, uh, part of uh, the reason why uh, it is so difficult. People are making linkage. Uh, there are countries that, uh, and you were the Minister of Culture and the member of the uh, uh, Parliamentarian Committee, so artists are boycotting uh, Israel. Artists uh, become uh, a political tool, a political platform. I'm happy that here the situation is completely, completely different. It's not that Lithuanians do not care. They do criticize Israel. But they make uh, a clear distinction between this one single issue to the overall relationship. Uh, I would like, first of all, to, to pay attention to what Madame Ben said. The the Israeli state and the Lithuania state see the elephants, the strong elephants, the front of us. And sometimes, if we are very, how to say, dogmatic, we think that if you see the front elephant, you need the another strong elephant to kill this animal. But it's not true if you are not dogmatic, you can invite a a uh, virus, very small virus, but it killed elephants. And your nation and our nation made that, you know. We we destroyed the Soviet Union really by singing. It was the strategy that was not in the minds of, of in Moscow. You also established your country by non-dogmatic strategy. So this is very important. But now we have here 2018. You are celebrating 70 years, we are celebrating 100 years, and uh, myself, I am really very interested in future studies, and I think we'll have a lot of the, not next year, but after 50 years or 60 years. So, how you imagine Israel 2048? You know, there, there, there can be different predictions. Uh, you quoted Tom Friedman, I will quote George Friedman, another Friedman was writing the book at the book and next 100 years, the history of the 21st century. He's predicting the revival of new Ottoman Empire in that in the region. Now you, your country is really now the part of really Euro-Atlantic community. Yes? Not only because you are in, in Eurovision, but you are really part of you are not a member of NATO, but the heart of NATO is working for you. So what will happen, what will happen after 20 or 30 or 30 years, what is your imagination? So now, stop to be ambassador and become to be the dreamer, yes, how to. Because now really we live in a very interesting, interesting time. Maybe my Lithuanian friends will not agree, but I will say that Lithuania now is living in the golden age. We are living probably in the last 400 years. We were never as much in the Western Europe. We are never as much rich, never as much secure as we are now. So, despite Lithuanian, you know, animosities, we are living. And Israel probably has the best in a few thousand years. But what will happen in, in, after maybe 40, 40, 50 years? How do you manage Israel 100? Because I wanted to add, well, many of our predictions are not uh, not uh, not going in reality. They were predicted, but we will live in the Asian century. We have already 2018, no Asian century, no Muslim century, no Chinese century, no Russian century. So we still have the Europe Atlantic American century. So what are your that's a very easy question to answer. And, uh, <laughs> I'll use your last uh, remark that uh, nobody really predicted. So uh, I have a proposal for all of us. Let's, uh, you know, in 30 years' time, so I'm going to be probably a professor of the site age. And I'll be more than happy to come again and talk to you about uh, what we have accomplished in the last 30 years. <laughs> I'm not, uh, in, seriously speaking, uh, also in my uh, small uh, neighborhood, nobody really uh, predicted the collapse of the uh, traditional uh, Arab state. The great experts, analysis, intel officers did not uh, see the uh, collapse of uh, Egypt, Libya, 
Syria, and uh, I think that uh, it is uh, really hard to predict what would happen in uh, uh, in our region. Mm -hmm. uh, I can tell you for sure that it will take uh, years to stabilize the situation in Syria. Syria will never, at least not in the near future, return to be what it used to be. At the moment, uh, you have there uh, so many uh, uh, different uh, entities operating on uh, Syria's soil. It's not just the uh, ISIL, Al Qaeda, Jabhat al Nasri, the Iranian, the Hezbollah, the uh, loyal forces to uh, uh, President uh, Assad, and many others. And uh, it's so difficult to bring them all to the negotiating table in order to talk about a ceasefire. That's why uh, it is so impossible to have ceasefire there, and thousands of people, many of them are children, uh, civilians, innocent people are killed every day, nobody really seems to care about it. So it's really hard to tell. What I can tell you is, because of that, nothing will change in the way we see uh, Israel. And uh, yes, security and defense is a very important uh, uh, element in our life. And for, two, for many, many years, our defense doctrine was based on two major pillars. One of them was preemption, and the other one was deterrence. So there is not going to be any change in Israel doctrine, but in recent years we added one more pillar, and it is defense. Because today Israel is not facing uh, uh, a threat from, uh, um, uh, from states, from conventional army. We are uh, facing threats from uh, non-entity players, what we call in the professional language, we are uh, subject to leak, to low intensity conflict. Non-state actors such as the Hezbollah in the northern, which is an Iranian proxy, uh, Hamas on the southern border, and all these uh, extreme elements that at the moment are uh, in Syria. But there is one thing that uh, uh, I'm sure about, that there will not be any change in um, Israel's uh, view that uh, we will have to defend ourselves by ourselves. That we will have to, if we would like to do something, if we would like to accomplish something, we should not expect that uh, it will come by a courier, uh, like, simply like this, we will have to do it. And there will not be change in, uh, in, uh, in that aspect, even in 10, 15, 20, 25 years. And I wouldn't count, uh, you mentioned that uh, NATO is working for us. You took it too far. NATO is not working for us. I hope that NATO will be working for you when the time will come. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, gentleman over there said that the, uh, the Jews are richer. That may or may not be true, but we certainly know they're much more successful in science. Israel has at least two living Nobel Prize winners, and not sure about the third. So, and you talked about exchange of children back and forth. What about exchange at the university level in science and technology where Israel is so successful? And also one other question, are Jews getting into the university and are they able to succeed there? Here? In Lithuania. Wow. Well, about uh, science, I can tell you that uh, I didn't mention all the things that we are doing, but very uh, just recently you have a very capable uh, uh, businesswoman, Lithuanian, uh, you all know her, her name is uh, Ostia Lanspergeni, uh, wife of, uh, uh, she, is, uh, uh, she has a PhD in education, she has uh, a chain of uh, schools and kindergartens. And just a few months ago, she opened 18 scientific laboratories in her school chain. She did it after visiting Israel and learning about our model. And uh, Dr. Berute Mishkiene from Vilnius University School of Business also visited Israel 
learn about it and about to open a similar kindergarten within the premises of Vilnius University. Vilnius University, uh, we are cooperating uh, a lot and uh, uh, we introduced lately uh, a different program, a voluntary based program. Students uh, here in Lithuania, and that's uh, something that we shared with, uh, with you, are going to mentor children who are in need. Children that are facing some difficulties in preparing homework. And in Israel, it works for so many years, this notion that I can give back, I can help. And I'm, I don't need to be paid for it. I'm doing it because I care. And that's what uh, we are now doing uh, in uh, Vilnius University. So you have about uh, 50 students that are mentoring um, our children uh, from all over, uh, uh, not Lithuania, but we started here in uh, Vilnius. And I hosted uh, them after the first meeting. And for me, it was so rewarding to hear their uh, uh, how they were talking after the first meeting. They were so excited about this uh, uh, meeting with the children. And they, they told me, the children were asking us, are you coming back? Are we going to have a second and a third meeting and a fourth meeting? Yes. And uh, I'm so happy that it is uh, 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 implemented. By the way, uh, there is also nothing that uh, you should know. There are over 200 Israeli students, 200 Israeli students who are studying here in Lithuania. The majority are studying in Kaunas Medical Science University, a wonderful university. I was about to mention that. Yeah, a great university. <laughs> I was there last uh, two, two weeks ago. I had dinner with them. They are so happy there. It was on your face. Yes, yeah. there is something that they are doing good in Kaunas that in other places uh, are failing to do. You know, the best ambassadors are satisfied clients. And the students in Kaunas Medical Science University are very happy. So that's why more and more are coming. I was told that next year there are going to be 300 Israeli students. And uh, yes, there is an ongoing cooperation. Uh, Professor Zhukowskas uh, visited some of our uh, universities, uh, the Weizmann Institute, Tel Aviv University, and uh, others. Uh, don't forget that uh, Lithuania universities uh, are under, uh, under, under going under uh, some reforms. And, uh, yeah, this is, <laughs> no, it's, it's very important. We don't have uh, as many universities as you have. We only have about eight universities. But yes, uh, we are cooperating. And Jewish. about Jewish, I think that uh, from my I, I was not I didn't hear that uh, a Jewish uh, student was not admitted uh, to uh, any academic <coughs> institutions. I can tell you more. And uh, you were talking about the past, but for me, uh, the uh, the most meaningful project is the, uh, the one that uh, uh, is related to the uh, Vilnius University decision to award with a memorial diploma all students that studied in Vilnius University but were forced to quit their studies either because of the German occupation or because of the uh, Soviet occupation. And we started this uh, project uh, a year ago, and four Jewish students uh, and professors were awarded. And uh, this year, the uh, professor, not only uh, the university, not only had the ceremony here in Vilnius, they also traveled to Israel and personally handed over uh, the diplomas to relatives, and in one case, to uh, a student that was expelled and lived this now in uh, in Arad, and she's over uh, 90 years old, so they went to her and presented her with the diploma. I wanted to comment. Uh, you mentioned the reaction of the United Nations institutions to the state of Israel uh, doings in the field of uh, human rights. I was ambassador at UNESCO for years. Each six months we had fights over the so-called Jerusalem resolutions and 
we have to correct the language, we have to overcome the enmity and so on and so on. So this is apropos, and I'm not going too deep into that, but uh, you will definitely see the support of Lithuania in that context. We even have to persuade European countries not, not to be very militantly against because it was absurd. The facts were on the table and it was just a politicizing of all the situation. But I just wanted to ask one question which is relevant and not relevant directly to Israel and Lithuania. I was always thinking, why in the world Syrian refugees, millions of them, are accepted by a poor state of Lebanon? A faraway culture like Germany, a faraway culture like the United Kingdom, but never by a rich and well to do brothers and sisters in Islam like Qatar or Saudi Arabia. Can you explain me why in the world they wouldn't accept their brother Syrians in, in need in this horrible situation? Well, why is it, is it a clear answer? Yeah. Because it's, it, it was so difficult to know. You know, Sorry, if, you, if you will, uh, <laughs> for many years and, uh, in the wealthy Gulf countries, uh, Egyptians and Jordanians and, uh, and others were working and they were uh, uh, ill-treated by uh, the host countries and today you won't find uh, you will hardly find the Egyptians uh, workers in uh, the Gulf countries. It has to do with uh, what this is my understanding. This is not an official uh, position. The uh, the mentality. The, uh, they despise uh, people that do not own land, and that's why refugees are people without land. And in certain cultures, it means that you are nothing. Basically, nothing. And that's why uh, they uh, uh, are not uh, accepted. <coughs> Secondly, I think that uh, it has nothing to do with the Gulf countries. It has to do more with where the Syrian refugees and other refugees would like to go. And come on, today with Facebook and social media, they all know that if you will read Germany and Italy, you will get uh, welfare uh, benefits from the local government that will uh, keep you far from uh, hard work, will leave you enough to send back home. So why bother and go to all these uh, countries where we will be ill-treated? Now, you have your own example. Lithuania agreed to uh, uh, Except over 1,000 immigrants. The majority of them left. Why did they left? Because they don't like Lithuania, the weather, the Sekalini. <laughs> <laughs> they simply get here a very uh, small uh, social benefits and they immediately uh, find a way to Germany where they get uh, three, four, five, six times more. And uh, for them, that's, you know, we don't need to work, we have enough to send back home. So I think that it uh, has more to do with uh, the uh, uh, decision of the refugees. Pragmatic choice. Of course. Yeah. So we need to, to call Frau Merkel. Yeah, but uh, she's uh, very much in favor of absorbing them. Well, and to add to your question, I have the modest detail that I had two students who were teaching psychology in Nicholas Ramirez University, two students from Israel, and they were doing very well. And also we had cooperation with Harvard University, and due to the visits of one of the professors, uh, I've got him introduced to this library, and they've started boxes of books coming from Harvard University as, as presents. It gives to our library. So, another small example of community of cooperation. But, uh, no. more questions? I, I have one reaction again to Ambassador's uh, thoughts. You mentioned ignorance in connection to anti Semitism. But this is, I was always wondering about this connection because Nazis, they were not uneducated or stupid. We had the story, the recent story in the Parliament of Lithuania with the academic uh, 
want to say ombudsman who said, uh, I will give 1,000 euros to a researcher that will bring me facts about uh, Jewish uh, KGB workers murdering Lithuanians and so on. But he isn't stupid as well. It's a certain disposition of mind and certain direction and certain lack of empathy. So what kind of ignorance has to be erased? How should we treat this lack of compassion, empathy, and, and will to cooperate, will to, to see the positive side rather than negative? Well, I, I, I'm not that educated, but I, I, I think that we live in a world where you can build the and you can find uh, uh, on nearly every subject uh, contradicting views, ideologies, and uh, for the Nazis it's very, it was very important to find the scholars, the musicians, the, uh, the intellectual that will support the uh, politicians uh, 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 ideology. And uh, we are facing it uh, today with so many uh, other issues, like, for example, the uh, Armenian genocide. Um, the major, uh, just recently, we learned about the death of a well-known Jewish historian, Professor Bernard Lewis. And he was very uh, supportive to Turkey, uh, stand that there was no genocide, while many other uh, historians claim exactly the opposite. About the uh, head of the uh, ethic uh, uh, committee, you know, I, my understanding, he was, uh, uh, he's probably nationalist, he was reacting to uh, the uh, uh, allegations that uh, were uh, presented about Vangas, about uh, Adolfus Romanowskas, not that I think that it, this is an excuse. He made a stupid uh, uh, statement. Huh? statement. Statement. And uh, just one detail, it is not coming from humanities or social sciences, he's from the technical sciences. Yeah, but he so was it, it's an you know, Yeah, he, he doesn't know all the details which are already published by Lithuanian yeah, yeah. scholars. So. But you know, you cannot, uh, we say, we have this uh, Jewish expression that uh, it takes 1,000 wise uh, people to take out the stone that were thrown by one stupid guy. Yes, also three flags were uh, hanged uh, over the bridge uh, on the day that uh, uh, Hitler was born and there are stupid people that are demonstrating from time to time. But I think that what uh, we should focus on is uh, where the majority are going. And I think that uh, for me, it's not what this stupid guy said. It's the immediate reaction of uh, your colleagues. And it's the decision that was made by the SAMAS to get rid of him. That's, I believe, uh, is, uh, uh, was uh, um, right on time. It was a quick response. No, sir, my country. Come on, we have extremists. And uh, it's not that we all are, wow, nice guys and we always say the right thing. We have our extremists, and from time to time you hear uh, statements that uh, uh, make me feel ashamed that uh, Israelis are making these statements against Arab and others. So I don't think that we should take uh, these uh, isolated incidents to the extreme. My main concern is about really this uh, uh, rooted uh, uh, perceptions that uh, Jews are rich, that uh, we are more talented. Uh, and yeah, and that's that's and this is not something that you can control because it, it's a kind of built-in, and that's why we need to invest in education. That's why we need people to better understand what was the contribution of the Jewish people to the building of your country, not my country. And that's why it is important to understand that when we are holding this class and you ask people, what do you see here? So it's not just about the empty half, it's the full house. And the understanding that it is our choice at the end of the day to which part of the class we are focusing. And to understand that when you are, and I'm always doing it, taking the A4 white paper and make a, a black dot in the middle and ask people, what do you see? The majority are saying, we see a black dot. No, you see a million of white dots and you chose to focus on this very small black dot. 
that's, I think that that's uh, in our hand to make the difference. That's why I said in the beginning that at the end of the day, it's all about people. It's the way we choose uh, to go. It's what we choose to say. And uh, if we can do uh, good in restaurants, why can't we do good in life? Yeah, but I think that our conversation about anti-Semitism is hopeless. Because I all my life try to understand, what is it? What is it? Jesus was a Christian girl. Jesus was a Jew. Uh, Maria was a Jew. Joseph was a Jew. Uh, all apostles were Jews. The first Christians were Jews. Uh, so why can you hate them? And uh, I can't understand, really, I read a lot of books about it. I can't understand. There are many, many explanations, but no one satisfies you. It is just stupidity, or it is in your... It is, you know, sometimes I think that our mankind is still on the level of tribe mentality, not of uh, Christian Judeo-Christian Jude, Jude, Jude mentality, but on the mentality of, uh, of, of tribes, which hate each other. They are the same, but they hate and kill each other. So uh, this is some, something which, which is not understandable. Christina, you could say maybe, because you were also interested in this question. Very interesting. Okay, I'll, I'll just tell a few stories, because uh, first of all, I'm very much delighted to greet his Excellency, in this building where I live, where my mom lived. And uh, she told me, you know, of all her Jewish friends, little children, that used to play in this yard. My family, they lived in the apartment which used to belong to famous Jewish oculist, Professor Markovich, who lived in Vilnius. Uh, my grandmother used to come to visit his practice here. After the World War II, it happened that we uh, moved in into his empty flat. Uh, Professor Markovich was killed during the Vilnius bombing when he was hiding in the Bible and he went to collect his little son voyage to help uh, another woman, a Vilnian, who started the bed. So I was just brought up with these stories and uh, uh, with the names of you know, Alec uh, and, uh, and Hannah and Yoshke uh, who used to play in the yard. A few years ago my mom, she uh, Give this interview about old Vilnius and about her memories of the Prime's past, and she mentioned all her Jewish friends that used to live here. She said, Well, you know, there was Alec, and then uh, there was Yoshke, and he was quite choleric, so we call, used to call him Yoshke Mishugin. After a few days, she got the telephone. <coughs> she picked up the telephone, and it was Gisa, and she said, Well, yes, hello. Hi, Gisa. This is Yoshka Mishulin calling. <laughs> Yoshka Mishulin now lives in Israel, but he happened to know her classmate because, you know, during my mom's time, all the Vilnius classes were half full of Jewish pupils who later moved out in the 60s. So she had her telephone number, she passed it, and the old, old friendship accidentally was rekindled. Um, after that conversation, she told me that, you know, what was most wonderful, we just picked up exactly at the point where we left off in the 60s when we left, like nothing had happened. So she probably is one of those people who buy those post stamps, and she still, is, is, still sends the postcards uh, to her childhood friends. My childhood was completely different. Uh, I was the target of the anti-Semitism. Class because it was just enough to have dark hair, brown eyes, and I was, you know, called Jew with most, uh, with all possible hatred that seven or eight year old can, you know, accumulate. So from that moment, I started hating, hating anti Semitism. Uh, and I'm very happy that, you know, in recent times, uh, sort of. When it comes at least to Vilnius history, I'm not so sure about the provincial towns, though I see also very positive signs there. 
But I think that at least in Vilnius, people start owning this history and rekindling the relationships that were had and trying to explore the history to notice exactly the cultural impact of the Jewish community for the um, um, for the history of Vilnius, for its culture, for its heritage. And I think that the most important thing is uh, to break the language barriers. We need more translators. We need more translators to be able to translate more books from Hebrew to Lithuanian, from Lithuanian to Hebrew, for people to be able to communicate, watch films or theatre plays or whatever. We were talking about the possible roots of the uh, anti-Semitism, and I think it's it's not the lack of education, it's just the ignorance, it's just the unfamiliarity let the children play. You cannot be you know, anti-Semite, uh, anti-Polish, anti-Russian, anti-whatever when you play together in one yard, because you judge uh, your fellow children by who they are, not with their national. We need more. We need to seek more interhuman relationships. So, the other nationality all leaders carry other which is called the white myths or the cliches and stereotypes. I call it love. That's what we are lacking. Yeah. It's not about translation of more books or better understanding. There is an international language. And it's language of love. The people will love each other a little bit more. Maybe it would be it would be easier. You sound like the Beatles. <laughs> <laughs> All we need is love. Yeah. No, I truly believe in it. Love and respect are two ingredients that we need more in our life. That's true. Especially for the mother. They are tired, they need to go on. So, on this very, very, very positive note, I'd like to thank very much for everyone who came, of course, to our key speaker, to our uh, dear speakers, Rena and the Lunas. And I'd like uh, to invite our key speaker, who was probably the main here, and the reason why we're here, to invite to another mission uh, and to congratulate. Irana, because she came to the library for the first time after her anniversary and she symbolizes the union for the life of origin by, by, by having and practicing and showing us two cultures and also a nice instance, nice example of love.